My guest is Pau Gasol. He is a two-time NBA champion with the Los Angeles Lakers, six-time NBA All-Star, NBA Rookie of the Year in 2002, longtime member of the Spanish national team, led Spain to the FIBA World Championship in 2006, FIBA Eurobaskets all-time leading scorer, and the founder of the Gasol Foundation. You can find them online at gasolfoundation.org. Pau, thanks for joining me on Sports Business Radio. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You know, it's uh, difficult times that we've been going through the last few months, but, um, you know, just trying to stay positive, uh, proactive, um, constructive. And, um, you know, that's kind of the way I believe is the best way to get through it. Yeah, I want to get to some of that stuff in a minute because your foundation is doing some amazing things. But I wanted to start off, I've wanted to have you on for a long time. You're so much more than just an athlete. And I've always been struck by the fact that you speak five languages. You could have become a doctor just as easily as a basketball player. And you're a classical pianist. You're, you're just a very uh, diverse person. What was it like growing up in the Gasol household? You know, we've, uh, we were lucky because we always had um, pretty much everything that we needed. Our, our parents really worked hard to provide that for us and provide opportunities. And I am as well diverse and rounded as I am because my, my parents gave me those opportunities, they gave me the opportunity to go to music class and piano class when I was eight and, and uh, allowed me to go to a school that I received a great education um, that um, exposed me to the world of, of arts and culture. Um, so I have a great appreciation. That's a big part of my life as well. I grew up in a household with my mom being a doctor, my dad being a nurse. So I, I wanted to be a doctor myself. Uh, and I went to, into med school uh, for a year um, until I, I finally decided that basketball was going to be uh, my main occupation. And I wanted to become a uh, you know, professional basketball player. I could see that it was really happening for me. Uh, and my parents would not let me get off the, the education route until I had more of a solid, almost gar not guarantee, but like a, a solid chance to do that. Um, so uh, again, it's all thanks, thanks to my parents and the, and the opportunities, the education that they provided for me. How difficult of a decision was that at that crossroad of continuing with medical school or going all in on basketball? You know, it was difficult in a sense because I love medicine. I, I really enjoyed everything that I learned that year. Um, and I wanted to, to continue learning. And, and one of my dreams was also to be able to become a doctor and, and be able to heal people and provide health to people, which is something so obvious, uh, but so important and now so highlighted uh, this pandemic and with the COVID um, situation. So uh, again, uh, that was, that was the, the hard part. Uh, the easy part was that I also wanted to become a basketball player and, and become a professional player and maybe one day get to the NBA. Um, so I couldn't do both. They were highly demanding careers. Right. I tried to do it for a year. It was extremely hard. I remember passing out a lot of nights with uh, books and notes uh, on my chest and just waking up with them in the morning. I was so exhausted um, just from trying to keep up uh, with everything. So, um, but it, it made me really appreciate how hard things are and how hard you have to work for. And, and, and when, once I made the decision to go all in into basketball, which is what I told my parents, that dad, mama, if I really want to become a basketball player, I have to give it my all. It's not about comfort. It's not about being lazy. You know, this is a full time dedication. So I convinced them that that was, even though they, they were, I had, we had a meeting with the dean after my first year of med school saying, hey, maybe Pau could do like only like three classes or two classes. So he doesn't really give it up completely. Uh, so like I can put it on hold and if basketball doesn't work out, I can get back to it. Um, but let me, let me give my full attention and energy to, to basketball. And I did, and it worked out obviously very, very well. When you played for the Lakers, uh, you used to go to children's hospital in Los Angeles. And I know you befriended some of the doctors there. Did that kind of scratch your itch a little bit? You, you couldn't be a doctor yourself, but you got to go observe some of those surgeries and, and befriend those people? Well, in, in every city, in every team that I played for, I've created a partnership with the Children's Hospital. 
uh, one of them at least. Uh, so in Memphis, we send you research uh, uh, hospital, and from the very beginning, since I was a rookie. I, I developed a, a relationship with them. My dad worked at San Jude. My mom volunteered as a doctor. Uh, so uh, my ties with the medical field and healthcare are, are and always been very, very strong. So once I got traded to the Lakers, I developed a relationship with Children's Hospital. Uh, once I went to the Bulls with Laura's children. Once I went to the Laker, uh, the, the Spurs, uh, uh, the Methodist Children's Hospital in San Antonio. So it's always been uh, in Barcelona with uh, San Juan de Leo, the hospital there, Children's Hospital. Uh, again, it's so important to me in basketball and my success as a basketball player has given me a platform and a level of impact with, with kids, patients, uh, that it's been one of the most powerful experiences that I've always had in my life, you know, to be able to touch a kid's life that it's fighting for its own life um, and, and bringing positive energy, get a few smiles out of them or ever, um, and, and spend really like powerful and deep humane uh, human experiences and connections. Those have been the most, the most uh, probably and greatest experiences of my career. Well, I commend you for it. It's amazing that you've always done that. I've gone with a number of pro athletes to children's hospitals. And one of the things they tell me all the time is all my problems go away. It really is a perspective shaper when you go into one of the hospitals there and you see the, the children and their families, you walk out going, okay, you know, maybe four for 13 from the field tonight isn't the worst problem going on in the world. No, it, it does. I think to me, all the work that I've done, all the humanitarian work that I've done has always given me great perspective, has allowed me to keep my feet on the ground and uh, has really put and reminded me what's truly important and how insignificant sometimes um, our own struggles are and uh, things that we consider important or really affect us that we really take to heart are not that big of a deal. Uh, I mean, not that you shouldn't care about what you do and you, know, you should work really hard for next game to do better and shoot better and contribute to, uh, to your team. And, and that, that edge is important as a professional athlete. And you don't want to lose it, but ultimately you do have to keep in mind, okay, this is not that big of a deal. If I uh, remember Popovich saying, you know, if losing in the first round or losing in the playoffs is the worst thing that happens to you in your life, you're, you're, you're in pretty good shape. You're, you're yeah. doing well. So, so let's just, uh, you know, not again, not that, cause there's, again, that's a competitive edge that you need to have as, as an athlete, if, especially if you want to win and finish at the top, uh, you, you can not really be okay with, with losing is, ah, it's okay. I missed it. All right. Uh, who cares? But, um, but there is an important sense of, hey, there's something bigger than basketball, bigger than sports, and, and it's beautiful that you can utilize your success in professional sports to touch people's lives, to make a difference in people's lives. And, uh, and I would definitely encourage all athletes to find their cause, find their passion, find uh, whatever it is that, that touches them, and, and to make a, make a difference, make a difference in, in those people's lives and those kids' lives. Your brother is also part of the Gasol Foundation. Mark just got a ring with the Raptors last year. Um, I know how important the foundation is to you and your brother. You're doing some amazing things right now. Uh, I saw in Los Angeles last week meals for people, thousands of meals, backpacks. Uh, you know, you're really stepping up right now to help people during this pandemic. And then, you know, going on and on, you work with UNICEF, you're, you're battling childhood obesity. Maybe tell us a little bit about the focus of the Gasol Foundation. Well, our, our focus and our mission is to battle ch childhood obesity. Um, one of the, probably, probably the biggest threat that children have been exposed to uh, for the last years. Uh, I, I learned along, you know, in 2012, 2013, that children that were born today for the first time in history had shorter life expectancies than, than their parents. Uh, this last year, uh, we've learned from the UN, numbers from the UN, that there was for the first time more obese people in the planet than people with hunger. Uh, we're, we're dealing with a, a terrible situation that we need to be highly aware of. Uh, 
Tech, the world is changing very fast. Technology is taking over. There are great tools out there, but it's making us have worse habits uh, to, that affect our health in a very negative way. And we have to be aware of that. You know, we have to really empower ourselves. And from the foundation, we just want to empower children and families to have healthier lives so they don't develop obesity, so they don't develop cardiovascular diseases, they don't develop diabetes, and they have a good quality of life and they fulfill themselves as adults and as people. Um, so that's kind of our, our mission with UNICEF. My, my, develop, my relationship has developed over the years. I'm, I'm a good, I've been a goodwill ambassador since 2003. Um, but at least last year also, I was named global champion for nutrition and zero childhood obesity, um, kind of focusing more on the nutritional aspect of, of my relationship with UNICEF. And, the, and it's one of the four pillars in our work with the foundation. There's physical activity, there's nutrition, there's quality of rest, and there's emotional well-being. You know, and I think that also as uh, now mental health is becoming more more of a normal subject to discuss uh it's not such a taboo anymore likely and and, and it's i think there's a lot, a lot still a lot of room for growth on that aspect but we we have to have that uh feel and an and aspect in mind uh, for us to continue to you know be who we want to be be you know being aware of our of our status, of our health, of our mental uh, health, deal with stress, especially now with the COVID. And that's why uh, our work has become even more important to be able to deal with the uncertainty, the adversity, the struggles, the challenges uh, that, uh, that uh, COVID-19 has brought onto us. It's very important that we provide with knowledge and tools to be able to manage that in a healthy in a healthy manner so uh we've we've been very proactive as you said we've created partnerships with world center kitchen delivering 4,000 meals in in la at the forum we're delivering uh, about 800 meals in in uh, san antonio texas uh along with our uh, all of our content as far as the uh, paying attention to healthy habits, uh, creating healthy challenges, what we call healthy, the healthy quarantine, healthy, bringing healthy smiles to people at homes during these difficult times and, and times that we have been forced to be confined into our own uh, homes. Uh, it's, you know, uh, all that it's critically uh, critical and, and we have to continue to, to, to push and be really proactive. And I think these times are times of need and times of need of leadership and people that are willing to go the extra mile and really um, you know, uh, take a step forward and, and say, hey, I'm here, you can count on me, I wanna help you, uh, we're, we're gonna get through this together. I know Rafael Nadal and you have uh, put a goal of $12 million to raise during this time as well. So again, there's leadership. I've seen Rafa doing things in the tennis world. I see you doing things in the world at large like you just described. You and Rafa have known each other for a long time. How did you come together on this initiative? You know, we're, we've been friends. We have developed a friendship of uh, mutual, more than mutual admiration, mutual respect for what we've been able to accomplish in our sports careers. It's been more like a friendship, a connection, a personal connection. And that's where uh, from a phone call, say, hey, you know, this is what's going on. It's really, it's really bad. It's really frustrating. What can we do? Well, let's let's join forces. Let's let's just launch something together. Uh, and we we uh, we came up with this idea of our best victory, and, and to really kind of um, uh, throw this this uh, call to action together with the Red Cross, which is called the the Red the Red Cross Answers, um, and and kind of try to bring all all athletes, all sports together, and be kind of like the driver. Uh, and putting out this, this goal of $12 million to reach over 1.3 million people in Spain, the most, the most, the most affected by this crisis at all levels. Um, it, that's kind of how we uh, was born from a conversation and text over the phone. And we just say, hey, let's, let's go. Let's, let's put it out there, you know, in a, in a couple of days. Let's just work it out. Let's record the videos. Let's call our friends. Tell them to join forces. Let's use our platforms to really put together a coordinated effort uh, to respond to this crisis. Um, and, and, and we did, and the response has been tremendous. We've uh, now 
at athletes, federations, um, leagues, uh, like joining in, chipping in, creating their own initiative um, to, to be a part of our, our, our call to action. Also the world of culture, artists, um, musicians have uh, joined in, the private sector, again, I think we created a movement in Spain that was very important because athletes sometimes are, are seen as role models, but where those role models have to step up when things get ugly. Uh, there can just be role models when things are going well and you're winning and, and people are like tapping you in the back how great you are or everyone, everything is kind of going on with their normal life. It's when the things get ugly when there's need that those role models have to step up and take action. Uh, and be proactive and and that's what we what we understand and what we uh, were able to kind of push push out and 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 bring to life again you're to be commended you're doing some amazing work right now i want to go back again to your your childhood your brother mark also nba player what was it like growing up were you guys competitive were you not really that competitive did you push each other to get to where you are today yeah, we were competitive. We were competitive um, and with everything that we did. There was a gap of age, four and a half years, that it's significant. Um, but nevertheless, I was always, you know, I always kind of try to push him to, uh, you know, if he wanted to beat me, whatever it was, he was going to have to work for it. He was going to have to earn it. And I was not going to take it lightly on him. And um, so I, you know, I always made sure that he understood I was a big brother. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that that uh, hopefully helped him kind of uh, wanting to, to keep working and to push himself and to uh, kind of also piss him off a little bit, if you will, to, 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 to get better and to try, to try to beat me. And he's become, you know, one of the best players also in the planet. And he's made a name uh, for himself because until probably until he was 18, 19, 20 or so, he was just Paul Gasol's brother. Um, uh, so he's, he's an incredible example of, of hard work, of dedication, self-discipline, commitment, and just, just, you know, his path was not easy. You know, when he went to, to the U.S., he gained a, a bunch of weight that he had to lose. He had to make a tough decision by leaving kind of the family that was with Mem in Memphis with me uh, and left after finishing high school, he left back to Barcelona and said, hey, I got I to gotta create my own path, you know, and, and, and I, I don't think being here is good for me. Uh, so I just got to just gotta go back. And, and he, he worked, you know, he, he really, really put his mind into it. And, and again, he's, uh, he's become an incredible basketball player, uh, but also a, a great human being. Well, and how crazy it is it that you guys get traded for each other. And then, yep. you know, obviously years later, you play on the Spanish national team. That's got to be a highlight for both of you, I would imagine. What pride playing for your country together with your brother? Yeah, we've had an incredible journey. Uh, we couldn't even dream of, of, the, of the things that we've been able to experience and, and accomplish uh, as individuals and uh, as brothers and as a family. So uh, we just uh, have been so fortunate uh, to, to, to be able to do that, um, that uh, we were able to play with the national team together in 2006 and won, winning our first World, World Cup in, in Japan. Um, then, as you said, being traded for each other, I think we're the only brothers that got ever traded for each other, even though Mark was not in the league yet, but it was his draft rights were with the Lakers and his draft rights went to Memphis when I went to, to LA in 2008. Uh, first brothers to start an all-star game. 2015 was an incredible uh, moment when we were able to jump off uh, that, um, in, in Madison Square Garden uh, during that all-star game. And then first brothers that ever won an NBA championship. Uh, so again, a lot, a lot of great athletes. Uh, to me, one of the things that I want us to do, and that's why we created the Gasol Foundation in 2013, was that... Uh, all this success that we were able to achieve in basketball and playing professionally, this is kind of, we're working on our legacy beyond that. And, and that's why we wanted to kind of give back and help children around the world to have the same opportunities that we've had, um, share the knowledge that we've gained and, and, and know that works um, 
through our lives, shared with, with the families that we work with, people in need, people that are in extreme sometimes situations, uh, families that have very little means um, so we want to make sure we, we're in touch with them because at the end of the day, they're, vul they're vulnerable populations, they're populations at risk, and, and we want to make sure that we are not neglecting them and that we're there for them and, and, and kind of uh, build kind of our legacy. I, I hope that the Gasol Foundation kind of surpasses us and continues to have impact beyond our lives. Uh, and that's kind of what we are building. Other than your parents, is there someone who you look up to as a mentor, someone who's taught you business or, hey, here's how you build a foundation, things of that nature? Uh, well, I've, I've learned throughout the way. I, um, I have learned by reading. Uh, so reading a lot of books have, uh, has been a big help. Uh, Peter Drucker, I uh, read a few books of, of Peter Drucker as far as managing um, a foundation or um, a charity um, and, and so forth. So I, I learned quite a bit from him. Uh, I learned from different foundations how they work. Um, and I've met with uh, uh, directors of uh, the most, some of the most founda uh, successful foundations. Um, and I've listened and asked questions and, and I think that that's been also very important. Um, and then just by uh, associating myself with people that, uh, that are great, they're, they have more experience than I do, bringing in board members uh, that are, are knowledgeable and I can learn from them and they can bring something that I cannot. Uh, so surrounding myself with highly, I guess, prepared and educated people uh, and experienced people um, have been, has been also a great source of, of uh, information and knowledge for me. You played for two of the greatest coaches in NBA history, Phil Jackson, Greg Popovich. I imagine you probably learned a lot basketball wise, but you probably learned a lot about life from them as well. Both very different, but what did you learn from each? Uh, I guess uh, with Phil, I learned a lot. He, he's just a fantastic coach and person that I you know, love dearly. Uh, um, and so I learned how to, uh, you know, meditation was a huge, you know, the, the huge thing that he brought, that it was completely new to me, that it was completely foreign and unknown. So for him to expose his players it's, um, into meditation, into a group meditation as well, and that then translated into reading about meditation, about experiencing it more, trying it more, getting into the habit of doing it, and how that's uh, you know, a very important tool in order to, to deal with the ups and downs of, of life, of, of sports, of centering yourself, of being mindful of where you are and, and who you are. I think those, that's kind of the biggest, probably the biggest takeaway uh, and biggest lesson that I've learned and has, a, had, has, has had the biggest impact in my life from Phil. Uh, from Greg or Pop, um, you know, a, a different approach. Um, I, I've, I've also learned some good things. Uh, he was more, um, he taught players, he taught our players about general knowledge, about caring about other causes. He's very involved and very, I guess, vocal about politics and about racial issues. Uh, he also gave books to the players, which I loved. Um, he actually gave a CD to all of us, um, two, two of them. One was opera, one was a, col a collection of Luciano Pavarotti's uh, 50 best performances or, or, or arias. And, and I love that, which I'm, I was already an opera fan, but I, you know, I appreciated that. And, and I think the other one was an African-American uh, singer uh, who was also you know, a great one of the all-time great, great singers too. And, and he, uh, he gave it to the to the team, so he he kind of um, and the thing that I like probably a lot about Pop is uh, which has been said is one of the like the keys to the to the Spurs family culture is how you know team meals something that uh, that he encourages and he encourages team meals after games on the road uh, so he makes sure that a good 
a very good quality restaurant. It's open after a game, but the whole team can come and uh, you can break bread and mingle and kind of come together and bond after a win, after a loss. Uh, you know, we're a team and uh, that's been a huge, uh, I think a huge thing, which is very difficult in the NBA because kind of everyone is kind of on their own, on their own bubble, uh, doing their own thing with their own friends. And he was very inclusive, uh, bringing everyone together in those and creating that, that chemistry and that familiarity within the team. So I think that that's important. That's an important one. I've heard that Pop is pretty legendary with his uh, selection of wines. He is a wine connoisseur. So I imagine you had some pretty good wine at those uh, team meals as well. Yeah, we had some really, some really good wines. Uh, I was always uh, very open and ready to enjoy those, those voices. Uh, uh, so, it, no, yeah, he's, um, he's definitely a, a wine fan, um, appreciates it. Uh, it's a big part of, uh, I think, who, who he is. And, and the wines were always present in those dinners. And not, not that everyone had them, not everyone has to love wine, but um, you know, I definitely appreciated it too. Much like yourself, very diverse. Again, you speak a number of different languages. Kobe Bryant, when I watched you two, you know, it was wonderful to watch you play basketball together. But I always kind of wondered, wow, these are two really bright people. They speak multiple languages. They have diverse interests. Kobe, you know, won an Oscar, um, was so well read, spoke multiple languages. What were some of the things that you guys discussed non-basketball wise? I would imagine those were fascinating conversations. Yeah, um, we had many conversations, uh, more so after uh, our time as teammates. Uh, where we were able to kind of get away from the on-court, um, I guess, mindset and, and uh, what we were trying to accomplish. I think once once you're in a in a position that you can win championships and, and you want to win them badly, that's all you think about. Uh, and that's kind of where we were immersed for the first part and during our, our years together as teammates. And we developed an incredible connection on the court, complemented each other very well. We communicated well. We created just – a great flow, very organic uh, from from the beginning, um, and then uh, and then uh, after we started talking about okay, what do we want to do? What do we want to build off the court? You know, whether it was business ideas, um, opportunities, we would uh, he would tell me what he was working on and he was thinking about, and I was and I would tell him what I was working on on my end, and and we would just kind of listen to each other and kind of chip in into okay, well. Well, let's see this. Let's see that. Um, you know, he was very passionate about creating content and sharing his knowledge uh, via books or a little basketball history. Uh, it's just uh, you know, the sh- with the short film was an incredible success, as you we all know. Um, but his commitment to to share his knowledge, to to leave a legacy behind, to share everything that he's that he learned through kids' books, um, you know, which you know, I think was, was great. And he also wanted to help players financially, so he created a fund where players could, um, you know, could invest comfortably and confidently, knowing that he was in it, that uh, he had a big stake at it, and he invested uh, significantly in it. Um, you know, the, the, the Sports Academy was also uh, to provide a platform for players to, to have that Mamba mentality. So he was all about have an impact creating um, and sharing and, uh, and just continuing to apply his mindset of, 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 I'm not just a basketball player, but I'm so much more than that. And I have so many opportunities and he always brought the best of the best. You know, when he brought his, when he was uh, writing his books, he, he talked to uh, George R. R. Martin, the, the creator of uh, Game of Thrones. He talked to Pablo Coelho, Pablo Coelho, the, the, the great Brazilian, Writer. He talked to the top writers in the world to, to pick their brains. And that was what everything that he did. Uh, he, he knew he had the access. He knew he had the respect. He, he was not embarrassed or scared. He did the same with Michael, you know, when he started playing basketball. I want to be the best basketball player ever. I'm going to make sure I send questions to Michael Jordan, pick his brain, uh, and, and absorb as much as I can to, to be – better than him really i mean that's what he wanted to do uh you know so um so i think it's a he's had so many lessons to to be learned from for for anyone for any person that strives to be the best 
that they can be. You know, uh, and that's uh, you know, I have a lot of a lot of great memories and lessons uh, from from him that I will apply for as long as I live. Yeah, I bet. Uh, I watched The Last Dance, and between watching that and and seeing Michael Jordan speak at Kobe's memorial service, it really did strike me that Kobe was really the only guy that kind of broke through Jordan's hard shell and, and got through to him. And as Michael described Kobe as a little brother and the respect that Michael Jordan had for Kobe and, you know, Kobe seemed like we, we always hear about that Mamba mentality. He seemed like he was built the same way that Michael was with practicing hard and, demanding championships and and there was really nothing less than that how was it playing with someone who brings that mentality to everything they do practices and and like you said outside of basketball achievements as well it was a privilege in order to to have that opportunity yeah uh, i uh you know it could be hard at times um but once you understood where he was coming from he just wanted to win he wanted to win badly. So he was willing to do whatever it took and to push his teammates to kind of bring their best and to bring that same edge and approach. And that is a huge factor why we were able to win. And it speaks highly of what type of the type of leader that he was as well. So he just learned a lot from, from Michael. He understood and had him as, you know, okay, he's the best uh, of the best. And he opened the door, so I'm going to capitalize on it, and I'm going to be as annoying as I can be uh, to absorb as much as I can so I can become the best um, and I can dominate. Um, so um, so uh, once I you, – you could see how badly he wanted to win, how much he worked, um, how dedicated he was. Um, you know, that's kind of what you want to be – associated with uh, and it's it's business you know it's nothing personal you know it's it's just competitive it's highly competitive you got to put your feelings aside and and just do do what it takes push yourself and and, and don't set short don't set, don't set yourself short and just continue to you know understand that, it, that if you're going to face hardship you're going to have to be prepared uh, and you got to have to you know, train that hardship uh, during, during practices um, and throughout the season. Well said. Uh, a few minutes left. The difference between basketball and Europe and the fans there and, you know, Eurobasket and EuroLeague and then the NBA. I have not spent a lot of time in Europe. I have not been at some of those big events there. You've been to both at the highest levels. What's the difference between the fans in Europe and the U.S.? Oh, um, I think fans, fans in Europe, they're highly passionate. Uh, I mean, now there's more games, but before there used to be one game in the weekend or, and kind of like almost, almost like uh, not quite as, as American football where you have like one, it's every weekend one game and the EuroLeague came along and then now it's uh, so two games a week uh, and maybe two of them or one of them were at home, the other one were, were away. So every game had a, an importance and a meaning. Uh, and fans are like diehard fans. They're loyal fans. If the team loses, that's, that's tough and that's hard. And they, they carry that with them. If their team wins, they're euphoric, they're great, they're happy, they're excited. Um, so I think that the, the emotional impact, it's, it's a lot deeper in Europe uh, by the affiliation. Um, players don't get traded so the, the I think the relationship and identification with players it's 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 higher uh for the most part uh, so that that's kind of where I grew up with then I came here so many games uh teams can move from city to city not, not very often but it has happened um uh, players get traded uh, teams can be like renewed pretty pretty quickly um and it's and there's so many games, right? There's so many games. So it's more of a, almost a form of entertainment. Uh, and there's, um, and if you win, great. If we lose, great. Well, there's a game tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it's cool. So, uh, and once I got to the NBA, that was kind of one of the, one of the hardest adjustments joining the Grizzlies because we weren't a very good team 
a team in real building that just joined a new city, went from Vancouver to Memphis in 2001, um, played in the pyramid uh, for, for a few years before the FedEx Forum was built. Um, again, um, it was, it was, we, I lost the same amount of games in a week that I had lost in a previous season with FC oh, Barcelona. Man. So I was like, <laughs> what, what's going on? Like I, I'm taking every loss so hard uh, and, and it's so painful. Like, what, uh, what can I do? Um, so I learned to deal and cope with that. Like, look, well, you got 78 more games. So, you know, if you got to just got to leave and that kind of next play mentality. You also kind of like learn to, okay, and on to the next one, next play. Forget about yesterday. Well, let's focus on today. Let's give your best shot today and, and try to win and, and do your best today, right? So I, I learned that what, during my first season. And, you know, and then uh, you work hard to be able to turn those losses into wins. And we were able to build a competitive team um, for, for a few years with the Grizzlies. And, and we had some good runs. Um, and then I got traded to the Lakers later on. And I had those opportunities uh, to win championships, which we capitalized um, on, on two seasons. Yeah. What's ahead for you? We've had some downtime here during – this pandemic, uh, I'm sure you've been able to get your foot healthy or at least healthier than it was. Uh, I, I've talked to some of my NBA friends and they said, you know what, Pau Gasol would be one heck of an NBA executive one day, you know, working in a, in a front office. You obviously, as we discussed earlier in the interview, you're doing so much to help the world at large. Have you thought during this time, like, hey, this is what I might want to do going forward? Well, first, uh, you know, I, I focus on what's at stake and what's uh, in front of me right now. It's trying to get healthy and trying to get my foot right. Uh, uh, it is getting healthier, um, but the, the, the confinement and the pandemic uh, has, has slowed me down too, which in a way it's been good because it's given me more time. Uh, in another way, it has kind of um, stopped me from taking some, some steps that I had planned as far as like doctors, visiting doctors, uh, may, making um, or designing my new orthotics, doing bi biomechanical studies uh, to be able to adjust to my, my, my mechanics uh, and make sure that the navicular, uh, left navicular doesn't suffer as much um, so, or doesn't take as much load as it, as it was. So again, um, my first goal in mind is to get my foot right, uh, hopefully as we are deconfining ourselves and kind of easing into uh, other phases, uh, uh, we, uh, I'll be able to do some of the things that I have, have planned uh, for late March and April um, and then uh, continue to move forward with my rehab and hopefully complete my, my healing and have a chance to potentially play again. Uh, I think during August, September, I will find out if that's, if that's the case. Uh, if that's the case, then I will think about whether um, you know, I want to play another season and get to play my fifth Olympics in 2021, which I was that I, my goal before the the, the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, and, um, but if that's not the case, the executive side definitely interests me. Uh, I've already had teams kind of reach out um, before I even uh, found out or decided whether I was going to continue to play or not. So, hey, we would like, we have you on our radar. Like we would, we are very interested in having you on board. Um, so that is definitely something that uh, would be, I think, a great transition place for me to be able to be a part of a team and a franchise from a different position and to build and be a part of a, a building process of a winning culture uh, in, you know, somewhere. So that's kind, of a, that's kind of an exciting part of it that, uh, that uh, I might get here sooner or later, but uh, I definitely have it on my radar, and it's something that um, it definitely interests me a lot. Well, I, you have my endorsement. I think you'd be one heck of an executive and uh, just a, a great mentor for the people playing for that organization. Last question. Uh, you know, you're a guy that, like you said, team meals, you like to go out and have dinner. If you can have dinner with, you know, you and three other people, let's say, Who's, who's on your dinner list? Who do you want to go have dinner with? Oh, man. I don't know. Uh, that's a tough one. You know, I'm not a, a person that idolizes or like, right. uh, uh, a, a, a lot, even though to me what I like mostly to, to two things. It would be with people that I really care about 
So family and closest friends, because at the end of the day, I think this pandemic has always reminded us to not take those people for granted. Um, so that's one thing. And I, I guess if I could have looking at not just a fun meal, but maybe, you know, if I had to, my last meal, I would, I would have it with people that I care about and people that I love. Uh, on a second version of it, um, I like to surround myself with people that, are, that stimulate me that I can learn from um, or they, and that I admire. So, um, so uh, people that could really, that I would be in tune of uh, accomplishing great things, being a game changer, um, really leaving a powerful mark in this world. Um, and who would that be? Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, whether it's Bill, Bill Gates being a powerful figure and a huge person, philanthropist that has impacted the world in, in many different ways. Uh, you know, that's very interesting to me, very powerful. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, another person that has uh, also had tremendous uh, uh, success with, with Facebook, um, you know, uh, that would be, a very interesting and in how he kind of channels his success into, you know, having great social impact and helping others. Uh, so that those are interesting. I wish I could have had dinner with Nelson Mandela. I uh, uh, was a, one person that I would have loved to, to sit down and, and listen. Um, and, and many other people that, you know, that, uh, that I would just like to get in a room with like passionate people, they were ready to, you know, to, to, to act. They're, they're ready to kind of combine efforts. And that's what I'm about. You know, I'm about making, being a part of a team, combining efforts, complementing each other, uh, you know, kind of uniting forces to, to reach a bigger goal and, and a bigger, uh, I guess, distance. So that's uh, whoever that, that was in line, that was, well, wanted to be a part of that. Um, I, I want you to be at that dinner. <laughs> Sounds like a great dinner. Well, look, congrats on a great career so far. Uh, I hope that you are able to continue to play if you want to. I hope you get that front office job if that's what you want. But, you know, again, you're such a diverse guy and uh, you've made a great impact on the world. I hope you stay safe during this time. And thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Pau Gasol, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Pau Gasol, and you can go to the Gasol Foundation website at gasolfoundation.org.